grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Heavenly Father, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Word of God before us this evening is recorded in John's Gospel, the 11th chapter, verses 33 through 37. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? This is the word of our God. Dearest redeemed in Christ our Lord, sometimes you will see them. And it's not hard to guess who they are just from what they're wearing. I'm talking about men and women who serve in our military. You often see them wearing their fatigues, coming home from combat on airplanes and airports and all sorts of transportation hubs, and people will take the time to spontaneously thank them, to thank them for their service, for what they are doing for this country because they have put their lives on the lines for us. How wonderful that is. But there are those that we don't see. Men who you would never have guessed that they once stood between you in every peril. Men who went because they were asked by their country to go. Some who volunteered and others who got volunteered. Namely, they were drafted. And you would never know it because they went off to war, they fought many years ago, they came home, and they lived quiet lives. And sometimes the first time that you find out that they were a service member, it is their obituary, where it's listed. Where you finally discovered that they were warriors for our nation. They were hidden warriors. But you just didn't know it by looking at them. The same holds true for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is a hidden warrior. You would not know that he is God's warrior sent for you. Just to look at him, he seems to be in utter, total disguise because he wears a human body that looks very much like our own. But don't be mistaken. Don't be mistaken because that hides the truth. That there is a warrior beneath that surface. An unmistakable warrior. God's hidden warrior. And that's what we look at this evening as we continue our theme that the Son of God goes forth to war. We look at God's hidden warrior this evening. Our Lord Jesus Christ. That Jesus is hidden is makes him kind of unremarkable. I mean that you don't really get that who he really is from the surface. That's what makes him unremarkable. He had a body like ours. He lived like us. He was born like one of us. He had to grow up. He had to learn. He had to sit in school and learn from people who did not know as much as he did. Reminding ourselves that he is the Lord of all creation. The God who knows all things and yet the incarnate God who had to sit and learn. He ate and drank like us. He needed to sleep like us. He had to be like us in every way. But he was without sin. And that's a distinction that is worth noting. A difference that really makes the difference when it comes to our Lord. We are sinners. We are conceived in sin, born in sin, we grow up in sin, we live in sin. Sin has so thoroughly penetrated us that we can't even conceive what it means to be without sin. We are thoroughly corrupted by sin. When Adam and Eve sinned against God, 
by rebelling against this command of not eating from that one tree in the garden, they brought sin into this world. And with sin, they brought death. And so now death reigns over all of us because of sin. And because sin so permeates us, we look at death and we think of death as just a natural part of our lives when nothing could be further from the truth. Sin so permeates our entire lives. It even touches our Lord. Think about that, that sin touches our, our sinless Lord. God really hid his son well. That even sin should touch him. Remember, he's still sinless. But he still had to suffer the effects of sin. And we see that in our text this evening. As he is at the tomb of Lazarus, you have the real effects of sin right before our Lord's eyes. And that is, sin took Lazarus out of his life. Death came to our Lord. He had to feel the effects of sin. Namely, he had to feel the effects of death upon him. Not going through death, but rather experiencing death by losing a loved one. In this way, our, our, our Lord is very much like us. We're all touched by the loss of a loved one. We're all touched by that loss of somebody who died and was taken from us so cruelly and evilly and maliciously by sin. Death comes to us all. And so we feel the effects of sin in our lives and we know that death is, it is something that does not belong. As sinners, we think, oh, it's just part of life. But when God created this world, he did not create this world to die. You were not made to die. We die because of sin. And our Lord faces that. He comes to the grave of his good friend Lazarus. You know the story. How he waited a few days before he ventured out to get to that tomb. And when he comes there, he finds out Lazarus has been dead for four days. He comes in the middle of the weeping. We should kind of remind ourselves of what the funeral scene is in Jesus' day. It's different than ours. In our day, somebody dies and we have time. Because our, our funeral directors, the uh, morticians, are very good at being able to embalm bodies, they're able to keep bodies. And so we can postpone funerals for a while. Not in Jesus' day. And it's not because things were so bad, it's just their tradition was. The moment somebody died, that's when the funeral started. It started right away. They would start preparing that body, wrapping it up, preparing it for the tomb. And the family would gather around as quickly as possible to say goodbye to their loved one, to get the body ready. They'd wrap it up and then they'd begin to carry it right out to the tomb because the family would have a crypt someplace. It'd be a cave where they could lay the body. And they would lay the body and roll the stone in front of it and let nature take its course. And so for about a week after they had done this, they would mourn. And it was a time where the community would come together to express their sympathies towards the family, telling them how sorry they were that they had lost their loved ones. And the family would receive them at their home, and they would receive them at the tomb. And so the funeral would take, this week-long funeral would take place. The family crying at home, crying at the tomb, moving back and forth. And it's in the midst of this moving back and forth that Jesus comes to town to meet the sisters of Lazarus, Mary and Martha. Martha meets Jesus first out as he comes into town and then sends for her sister Mary. And Mary comes 
to Jesus. And that's really where our, our text picks up is Jesus entering into this morning. And they take Jesus out to the tomb to show him the place where they have laid his good friend Lazarus. And that's where we get those wonderful words, Jesus wept. It's a very short verse in the Bible. One of the shortest. And in, in these two words, it tells us a lot about who we have here in front of us. We have somebody who sympathizes with us in every way. Jesus sympathizes with us. Here he is at the, good, at the tomb of his good friend, crying over his loss, weeping. God's warrior is weeping over death because he understands death in a way that we don't. He understands death in the terms of God. That death is our real problem because it's the result of our sin. What sin does is it separates us from God and it leads to separating us from God eternally. Because death portends the eternal separation. God did not make us to die, but God made us to live. And death is unnatural. And that's what Jesus could see. But don't let Jesus' tears fool you. Because underneath those tears is a fierce warrior. God hid his warrior in bodily form, but what he hid was the Almighty God, the eternal God, right there in that person. When Jesus came to the tomb and they saw him weeping, the, those who were there asked the question, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? They instinctively knew, looking at Jesus, that there's something wrong with this man. They knew there was something wrong because he was not normal. They picked up on it. He was not sinful as you and I are. He didn't have any sin. Imagine what it must have been for his parents when he was growing up that here they had the perfect child. And not because they were proud parents, but they had the perfect child because he was the perfect son of God never sinning, neither against them nor against God. How in the world were they to discipline him? As you think about who Jesus is, those around him picked up on this. This man is perfect in every way. And here he's performing these wondrous signs, and yet they looked and they thought, he should have been able to stop this because death is not natural. But what they're also picking up on is that this is God's hidden warrior. Because beneath this surface, beneath the tears that Jesus was crying, is the eternal God. And Jesus' tears are very different. They're very different than the tears of Mary and Martha and the crowds that were there. John makes sure that we know this. Shame our translators don't, but John does. In the Greek, the terms used for weeping for Mary and the crowds that were there is different than the term for Jesus weeping. John uses two different words. The word for Mary and the crowd indicates that they were, this was a loud wailing that was normal at, at funerals. It was, it was the loud crying that people would perform. When John says Jesus wept, he uses a word that tells us that you could see the emotion on Jesus' face. You could see the tears coming down his face. But it was a quiet weeping. It was a powerful weeping. Because what Jesus felt 
was the power that death had over us. What Jesus was going to declare was the power that he had over death. Remember what Jesus says to, to Martha, that he is the resurrection and the life. You know this story and you know it well. You know what Jesus does. You know that he doesn't end with him weeping. It ends with him raising Lazarus from the dead. That Jesus was doing, what he was doing at this tomb was taking on his foe. He was taking on death for us. He was there to beat death back, to have a small victory, but a victory nonetheless over death. When he raised Lazarus from the dead, it was there to tell people this was the fight he was there to take on because Jesus had come to fight our battle for us. He had come to take on our foes for us. He was God's hidden warrior. He looked very much like you and I. People could mistake him for being one of us. And indeed he was. But he was also the Son of God. He was the Son of God incarnate in bodily form to here to take on sin, death, and the devil for us, to climb the hill of Calvary, to take on our sins at the cross, to beat back the devil, and to enter his own grave, but not to stay there. He would take on death another time, and this time he would fight death himself, defeating death, rising from the grave, breaking the bonds of death, so that you and I now when we look at our graves, we know it is not our final resting place. It's temporary. Because Jesus' victory over death is our victory. What God has done for us in Christ is beaten back death for us. So that now, God's order is restored. And you and I know we have the promise. The promise that the tomb is not our final place. We have the hope of the resurrection. That we too will hear Jesus' words calling us from our own graves, from our own tombs, that we should rise forth to live with him forever. And that's the wonderful news of God's hidden warrior. We won't stay. Not in the grave. We will stay with him. And no longer will he be hidden, but God will reveal him for all the world to see to be his wondrous warrior, the victor on Calvary, the victor for eternity. May God's hidden warrior go with you and give you hope in the power that he has over sin, death, and the devil, now and forevermore. Amen. Please stand.